so we are today in Isaiah 58, 6 through 14. Um, looking at this idea of, you know, so here's the spoiler, worship and action. So yesterday we had Micah 6, 8, which really talked about what it is we are to do. How are we to be a people, um, act, to love, to do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. Um, today we're looking into worship itself. And so, as, as you probably expect by now, before we get into Isaiah 58, some context, some background. Isaiah is one of the three major prophets. Can anyone name the other two? Jeremiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Yeah. If you're not sure which ones the major prophets are, they have the most. <laughs> They're just the bigger ones. And then we have 12 minor prophets. Um, for you music people out there, the difference between a major prophet and a minor, minor prophet is just the interval of the third, if it's a half step higher or lower. <laughs> that was a, that was or just, publishing. yeah, right. Or, or uh, yeah, in that case it's publishing. Um, I guess they just had better publishers. No, uh, I mean, a lot ha was happening with them, but because Isaiah is so big, there was so much going on. And, and scholars break up Isaiah into three parts. First Isaiah, second Isaiah, and third Isaiah. Uh, we, we just read it all in one thing. It, but it helps to get a sense of the themes that are happening. Um, first Isaiah, which is really one through around 40, 39, 40. First Isaiah, Isaiah, it's before the exile. So just like with Micah, Isaiah is preaching to the people saying, you've got to change your ways. Um, you, you have to start taking care of the least. You're, you're uh, not taking care of the widows, the poor, the orphans. You're focusing on worship too much and making too big of a deal out of it and forgetting the purpose of, of that worship to lead you to act. Um, and you're just thinking about how good things look, how great your worship might be, and it's offensive to God. Jeremiah hits that even harder. Jeremiah says, you know, um, according to God, you know, God says, your, your incense, incense is offensive to my nostrils. Your worship is offensive to me because you're focusing on, on it so much and missing all of my children. Isaiah has a similar theme. A theme of uh, the day of the Lord is coming and it's not going to be good because you've neglected God. And so this, this punishment this um, abandonment is coming. Um, and that is, you know, the exile. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, they come in, they conquer, and the majority of Israel is forced to leave. That's first Isaiah. Second Isaiah is when we have, you know, from 40 to about 55-ish. Uh, um, it, it, it's not clear, because right? the themes start to to move, it's, there's not a clear, um, now we start the next part. They start to slowly move into the next idea. But Second Isaiah is written to a people who are in exile. And instead of this, this message of you've got to change, this message of you've got to you know, get right, it's a message of hope. Don't give up. God hasn't left you. Um, you are going to be okay. We're, there we get the servant songs. Um, that we often we, have, we tend to read around Advent time, reminding us of the Messiah who is to come. Isaiah is saying there is going to be a Messiah who is to, who is going to come and going to lead us, going to free us, going to liberate us. Um, so speaking to that, and then and moving on to this eschatological, this end time kind of thinking of and not only freeing us and bringing us back to Israel, but redeeming all of creation. So speaking to a people who are oppressed, who are in a place of, you know, they're not in their homeland. Uh, and, and they are a second-class people saying, God has not left you. Trust in the Lord. He will lift you up on the eagle's wings. It's one of the passages we hear. Um, we, uh, we, you know, Christians, we love to stay, um, dwell on 2nd Isaiah, especially around Advent, because we see those similarities of talking about Christ and the hope of Christ. Um, and it speaks to us in our own places of, of struggle and distress. So that's 2nd Isaiah. Third Isaiah is speaking to the people when they've returned. Um, speaking to them as they're trying to get a sense of how do we now become again the people that God wants us to be. Rebuilding the temple, reclaiming their worship practices, and getting a sense and asking those questions of where was God 
when we were in exile? Where was God when we were conquered? Where is God now? Because very real theological questions. So written in this time when the rebuilding and restoration of Israel is happening. Uh, now, before you, you ask the question, is this all one person or not? Um, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, so, I mean, because, you know, for some, you could read that and say, one person was, Isaiah was with them in the exile. Beforehand, Isaiah was with them in the exile, which was 70 years. And then Isaiah was with them afterwards. And maybe, it, who's, who's to say? It's possible, right? And so it could have been one person. Or it could have been a school of thought. Um, that, you know, that there was an, a prophet Isaiah, especially before the exile. Um, and maybe went with them in the exile, maybe not, but... Your prophet very likely had students, had people that walked with him, that studied with him, that learned his way of thinking and speaking and writing, and continued that, that, that mantle of Isaiah. And so, you know, you have God speaking through others in the exile and others speaking when they've returned. Another way of, of looking at it. Because you might say, like, how could someone be alive for that long? It's possible. With God, all things are possible. Um, but there are scholars who suggest that this is really uh, the school of Isaiah is continuing all throughout, um, throughout this. And it's not unheard of for people to write and take on the name of someone else. And an orange is coming towards me. <laughs> is this yours, Linda? Right, right from Florida. Right? <laughs> right from Florida. Like this rolled all the way from Florida? <laughs> some throw tomatoes, some, some throw oranges. I know, I don't know how to take that. <laughs> If you gave me two more, I would reference For the Love of Three Oranges. That's an opera, right? Well, look it up. <laughs> I think Prokofiev wrote it. That's for your, that's, that doesn't matter for this. Uh, the, uh, the point, though, is regardless of how you, under, how you want to look at authorship, and I want to give different theories out there, and you can re wrestle with that as you want, is there still is a continuity in the ideas and the writing and the voice all throughout Isaiah. So when I say 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Isaiah, I don't want you to get stuck on that saying like there's three different books now and we have to rethink it. It just helps us to think about the, the tenor and the themes that are happening in these different sections uh, and to know what's going on with Isaiah. And it's important that, I, if, if that this, whoever this is or however this happened, that this is someone who had been with Israel before, went to exile with them, and is returning. So not someone who was there waiting for them to get back and said, now let me talk to you. But someone who's experienced with Israel all that they've gone through. So it's speaking to and coming out of the experience of Israel. I said, and I think that's really important. So this passage that we're looking at today, Isaiah 58, third Isaiah. So time of restoration, time of bringing things back together. Uh, and, and a time of, of looking at this idea of fasting. And we'll talk about fasting today. Isn't that going to... Who, ate, who had breakfast today? Yeah, me too. But starting now, we're going to fast for the rest of the day, right? No. No. Wow. I was like, a uniform. No. <laughs> yeah, right. Wow. Okay. So I guess uh, no fasting today. <laughs> well, yeah, we can fast till 1030. We will collectively agree, except for Linda, because she has that little orange. Um, <laughs> Linda can eat, but the rest of us, we're going to fast until 1030. <laughs> That'll be our devotion to God. Um, so, sorry, Linda. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to say, I'm just going to thank God for this orange. <laughs> yeah, right. Just thank God for the orange. Everybody else is going with that. Well, I want to see, sorry, this will be the last comment on the orange. I'm going to let the orange go. I want to see if we can actually share it and see if there's enough to go around with everyone. And if we end up with 12 baskets of orange left. <laughs> that, that would be something, right? Yeah, boy. Let's not even try that. Let's not tempt God in that way. So a little bit about fasting. Fasting... Um, is, is normally done as a sign of sorrow. Um, it's a ritual of mourning. And when you're in a time of grief. This is um, primarily in the Hebrew scriptures in that time. Um, so fasting is something you do out of a place of contrition, out of a place of grief. Um, it's not a happy, joyous um, practice. 
Uh, the only day, there's one day that's prescribed as a, fat, as a day of fasting in Israeli, um, you know, Israel cultic law, and that's the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, a day of fasting. And I believe that for many that has continued to be observed. It is. Yes, good. Uh, and, and it is this way of like, bringing a response to one's relationship with God. Uh, near the end of today, we'll, uh, we'll talk about fasting in, in a Christian practice and different approaches and different ways of thinking about that. For now, let's just keep our minds in the Israeli Judaic understanding of fasting. So fasting coming out of this place of grief, mourning, contrition, penitence, of, trying, of looking at our relationship with God and trying to find, to start to rebuild that relationship. Um, so that's, that's what's going on. And Isaiah 58 is speaking to a time when there is this uh, trying to reclaim the worship experience, trying to re, uh, rebuild the temple, trying to rebuild relationship with God. And fasting will be a part of that. Maybe just on the Day of Atonement, but maybe um, also in a place of saying we recognize how we've um, faltered and fallen. So, th so that's part of what's going on. But I want to... Then I want to give you a little bit of context of 58 before, you know, before verse 6, verses 1 through 5, because it, it leads up to 6 well. I mean, as always, you want to read before, you want to read after with every passage, with every bit of scripture. You want to put it in context. And if you want, to, if you want the best context, you should read all the way at the beginning and read all the way to the end, which is Genesis to Revelation. So anytime you're studying one scripture, read the whole Bible so that you really get the context. Have to do that, but I mean a chapter or two before, chapter or two after, um, just to get a sense of what's going on. I'm going to start. I'm going to start with just 58 itself, and 58 starts with shout out, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, announce to my people their rebellion to the house of Jacob their sins. Isn't that interesting? How it starts with shout out. Lift up your voice like a trumpet when I just said fasting is something that's done out of grief, out of mourning, out of pen, uh, penitence. Uh, and to say, here's what I want you to do, to shout, to share, to, to not hold back. But it, not hold back with joy, but announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Make public what it is that you are grieving about. Uh, which is a scary thing. I mean, how many of you, those of you in the Roman Catholic tradition and others that have confession, um, it's, it's in a little booth, right? And it's supposed to be kind of private and, and you're not like shouting, Father, forgive me, I've sinned and let me tell you what I've done. <laughs> you're usually quiet about it. You, you know, you don't want to brag. I mean, and you don't, and you especially don't want to share in a public way. But here, Isaiah is saying, no, no, really share what, what it is that's been going on. We're almost turning over that ritual approach to the idea of fasting and repentance. Verse 2, day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. So they come to me to worship as if they were all good, and, and not you know, forgetting that they had forsaken God. <coughs> they ask of me righteous judgments. They, they delight to draw near to God. So speaking to now, we're getting the sense of what Isaiah is seeing in the worship. That you're people who tend to have, or having this practice of saying, we're good, we're going to rejoice, everything's right with God, and Isaiah is saying, you're missing it. Uh, because you really need to repent. You need to bring on this aspect of grief, and you're not hearing me, and it's almost as if Isaiah is saying, I need to, we need to be shouting how much you have missed the mark in your relationship with God. And just because you're back from exile doesn't mean all is good. So now we have the question, verse 3, is this question, Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? This is the people asking God. Well, we're fasting, and... Nothing, we're getting nothing from it. Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day. This is a prophet responding to them. You oppress your workers. You fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Do you hear what's going on here? So Isaiah is, is seeing this shallow worship. Um, that the, the people are fasting 
Um, and then saying, we fast and we don't hear from God, so why are we bothering? And Isaiah is saying, yeah, but your fast is, is a time of when you're quarreling, probably saying, my fast is better than yours, or if you're going to fast, you need to ha eat nothing, and others say, well, maybe some water and some figs, um, you know, arguing over this. And then they also have workers and stuff, and so you'll have people saying, well, I'm going to fast, but I want to make sure you're still serving me my meals, or taking care of the household, or doing what needs to be done. So oppressing the workers, and Isaiah is seeing all this happening and saying there's such a shallowness in your worship. And, and you're still expecting God just to answer, I am going to shout out everything that you're doing that's wrong. So a worship, an approach to worship at a time when they're trying to reclaim their relationship and rebuild the temple, an approach to worship that is thin, um, that um, is full of um, just contradictions that does not have that, that depth that God really desires. This is what Isaiah is seeing and speaking to. So verse 5, we're almost at verse 6, and then we'll, really, we'll take our time and I'll listen for translation differences and such. I just want you to have this context. Is this the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? So, is the, so God, this is God asking, and these are wonderful rhetorical questions. Is this what I want for you just to, you know, to lie down and to say, oh, I'm so, you know, you know, so worthless am I, I'm humbling myself, now I'm worthy in the eyes of the Lord. God's saying, is that really what I want? Uh, and, and it's not one of those where you say, well, yeah, Lord, that's what you said. It's what you sit there and you're like, oh, no, because that's the next thing is the, the other shoe is going to drop in a sense. So leading up, ad, giving this rhetorical question to, of we're supposed to, we thought we were doing everything right and you're missing it. So you with me so far before we get into this? It's really, it's a critique of worship. And I imagine some of you already are thinking of your own worship practices, your own worshiping communities, and wondering, do we do this as well? Do we put on these airs? Do we put on a facade? Do we put on a show thinking this is what God wants and missing what it is really that God desires from our, our, our practice of worship? Yes, Bill? I'm forgetting whether they're back yet or not. I think that they are. And when they got back, it's a, it's a crash zone, basically. Yeah. Things are in ruin. Yes, so yeah, they're back. And, oh, and thank you, Bill. I, would love you. It's, I think that's important to reiterate. Seventy years in exile. And Assyrians and Babylonians, when they took them in exile, they took the, the, everyone with skills, everyone with abilities. They destroyed Jerusalem and left just a, like a small fraction of Israel and not the, the people that really knew what was going on. And they did what they could. But when they get back, they really do see like the temple is in ruins, the infrastructure is destroyed. Like they're, I mean, I mean, a, a disaster had gone through, and, and Israel just sat for seventy years. And so now, so they are trying to say, how do we rebuild? And they're focusing on worship. Let's give the you know the Israelites some credit here. They're they they they're, they, they're trying to do what's right, and they're saying, let's get our worship right. You know, let let's try to start you know in the right way, and let's make sure our fast. Our approach of fasting is right. There is a sense of, of you know, we fell in, in the eyes of God, so we're going to have this mourning, this humility. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to paint them as these people that are all just like they're getting it wrong again and again and again. But um, they are, but they're still trying. You know, the same as if we, if we critique any church practices today, uh, some I'll, I'll go ahead and just overtly say that's just wrong, 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 but I'll let you know when I feel that way. But the majority of Christians are trying. They're trying, and yet we still miss it. And, and I, so thank you, Bill, for that, because I think that's really important for us to remember when we're reading this, because it it's so easy to put ourselves in a place of judging the Israelites and standing there with the prophet, and we could imagine ourselves just like with the prophet saying, yeah, you got it wrong, when probably we're the ones that the prophet's yelling at. What, I think what's going to be like when the people of Ukraine finally get yeah, that's if you didn't hear that, what will it be like for the people of Ukraine when they finally get to move back into their country? Those who had to flee, those who that and that that's probably a good sense of what it was like to go back to Israel. Yeah, how will you worship in a church after you've had 
that kind of destruction and chaos. So they're trying. And Isaiah is calling them out for how they're missing. So now we get into the text itself. Isaiah 58, um, 6 through 14. We're going to, I'll read, uh, you know, it in sections. Again, there's a lot happening here, so please take a look at your own translations. Uh, And let me know if there are words, phrases, things that jump out at you that are just a different translation. I'm going to start with verses 6 and 7. Is not... Sorry, yeah. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not hide yourself from your own kin? Other, uh, any translation differences? What do you have, Donna? I have flesh. Oh, flesh. And the bonds of wickedness. So that's to loose the bonds of wickedness instead of injustice? Mm-hmm. Let me do, let's do kin and flesh first and then we'll get to wickedness because I think there's some, I, I think it's interesting that we have um, not hide yourself from your own kin or your own flesh. That does speak to this real familial understanding. Um, and uh, and I, so kin and flesh, I think, could be interchangeable. Um, I, it's hard, I'm not, I, I don't hear too big of a difference, but I think that emphasis versus your own family or your children or your neighbors is still, it's, I think it does speak to this intimacy um, in the family, in that family unit, and to say to, hi, to not hide yourself from those who are supposed to know you best. Of the earlier one, to loose, to loose the bonds of injustice or you have wickedness. Uh, if you remember from yesterday, the idea of justice, the idea of justice that was mentioned that, that Micah uh, was using, because there's different words for justice, was one of calling out those places where there's imbalance, where some are being treated worse than others. You know, so doing justice is calling that out and, and trying to bring this balance or I'd say this sense of shalom in, this, in the community. Um, that's the word here as well. I, my feeling, wickedness kind of gets to that as well. Um, I think when we're looking at the prophets, um, the word justice has this cachet about it. It's, it's, you know, when you hear the prophets use the word justice or injustice or something about, so I, I mean, again, it's not, that translation is not wrong. You're hearing my preferences if I were to choose. Uh, so I would still lean towards injustice, but wickedness does bring this kind of evil sense about it, that it's not just some people who are being negligent. This is something serious that's happening. So I like the, the having both there. That's good. Other translation differences? Don. Um, in the Amplified, at the end of verse 6, it puts in parentheses, it, uh, it says, and that you break every enslaving yoke, and it refers to Acts 8.23. All right, so it says in the end of 6 that in parentheses that you break every enslaving yoke, and it refers to Acts 8.23. Yeah. Does someone have that at the, at the ready? Because I don't have Acts 8.23 memorized. <laughs> I don't have much memorized. I just found it. Here we go. Um, all right, so Acts 8.23. I was a runner-up in our sword drills growing up. Um, <laughs> runner-up. Almost good enough. Um, for C... For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. So there it's speaking of, of these, uh, that thing, so freeing from the yoke of enslavement, Acts 8.23, that you are in the, the chains of wickedness. Now, of course, this makes me think, so what is this going on? I don't know what's happening here, so I have to look at the bigger text of Acts 8.23, which looks at Acts 8, uh, which you have Philip preaching, um, and then I'm just looking very quickly. So there you have John and Peter, and they're preaching. Simon is, is doing some stuff, who's also Peter. Um, so this is part of Simon's sermon, um, Peter, Simon Peter's sermon, um, that he's preaching Oh, yeah, to people gathered, and, and they're interacting with, uh, I think, with the magician at the same time. Samaria. To the witch? They're in Samaria. Oh, so they're in Samaria. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, I'm like trying to scan it and get a sense. So, so when he's saying you're, yet you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness, it could be still part of this animosity between Jews and Samaritans. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Uh, so don't ask today, because then I'll have less to talk about tomorrow. Um, so it could be a, a cultural 
um, commentary, or it could just be that as a society, I see that you are floundering. Um, it's interesting. It's, this really, it, the comments are really interesting. That that is, has that reference. That it's taking the yoke of slavery and then referencing it to Acts 28, which is more of a societal um, wrestling as well. I'm not saying it's wrong. I it's just find that moving from the idea of slavery to more to a broader understanding. So, thank you. Yes, Scott. So, I believe your reading of that line was and that. That, that line just before verse 7. Mm -hmm. Would you reread what you had? Um, I'll start at the, the colon. To loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Okay. Here's so a question. She and I both have the pronoun you, and that you break every yoke. And I'm wondering oh. if that's significant. I'm wondering if that's a, so. Is this not the fast I choose to loose the bonds, to undo, to let the oppressed go free? And then it says, and you break every yoke? Mm -hmm. I wonder why they put the pronoun in at the very end um, and not all the way through. I think it changes the meaning. It does change the meaning a bit. The fast I desire is that there be, you know, loose the, so it's almost a passive to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break the yoke, break every yoke. And it could be, I mean, if I had to speculate, I, I, I don't know for sure, but one of the critiques that we had just heard was that on the Sabbath, you're making your workers work. You're oppressing people. So it could be that sense of, an, and you stop having other people still work on the Sabbath. Um, so that's interesting that they have the pronoun there. I, I don't have a good answer for that. Yes? It's interesting that um, I have a question mark there, and you use the word question. Yes, it, it is, it's a question mark here as well. And I think it's another one of those. So, I mean, this is, that's an editorial choice, because as we mentioned yesterday, there were no, there's no punctuation in the Hebrew. But, you know, this, the, the, the rhetoric is one of questions, where right beforehand... Um, is such a fast I choose, a day to humble oneself? We have these questions that God is asking. And so is this not the fast I choose that you do all these things? These questions. And it continues with, this, with these questions. And so that's a rhetorical ploy. And that I'm sure we still do today when we ask those rhetorical questions. Um, didn't I ask you to clean your room? I'm like, yeah, you did. Now, I just wasn't looking for the answer. I wanted you to go and clean your room. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think it's an editorial choice, but one that makes a lot of sense to have that question in there that God is, and, and it's Isaiah speaking it, but God is speaking through Isaiah. Um, and that God is kind of having this voice that, that's calling the people to shame. Other, any other, we only did two verses here so far. Any other translation? Now let's, let's move on, if that's all right. Good. I'm going to read 8 through 12. So we're going to do, a, this is a bigger section. Uh, so I would say follow along and try to remember if anything jumps out. Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then he shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in the parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be re rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. A lot going on in there, too. Translation uh, differences that jumped out? Yes? Is this right at, uh, uh, I mean, verse 9? That's interesting. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of vanity... That's interesting that it's vanity instead of evil, because those are two different um, understandings. Um, how does, how does uh, Ecclesiastes start? Does anyone remember? Yeah. 
Yeah, in Ecclesiastes, it's vanity of vanities. Uh, in which, so there we have that word as well. I'm just interested, that's interesting that they have that word vanity instead of evil. I think in the bigger context that makes sense because they're saying, look at our worship, look how good we are. They're thinking about themselves and not thinking about the least. Um, evil has a different, is, is, uh, has a more of a punch to me. Well, can you uh, see the original and decide what's the correct and most correct? Uh, I can't because I didn't bring that. No, no, oh. but I mean, is it possible? Oh, yes, um, it is. It very likely, it's a both and. Um, what tra- do you know what translation you're using? It's an old fashioned one. It's ye and by and thou. Oh, okay. So King James. Oh, so King James. So that brings in. All right, back up for a sec. Um, more translation stuff. This is great. Because um, so that brings in a lot of different questions. Because the King James primarily uses a different manuscript, um, especially in the New Testament, but some in the, uh, in the Hebrew Scriptures, than newer translations. Uh, because more, you know, they, they, people are finding older text. And the prevailing thought is the older the manuscript, the more accurate it is. Which kind of makes sense. It'd be like if you were going through one of your cottages and you found a letter that your great-great-grandparent wrote. And you had another copy of it that your grandparent had transcribed and given to you. And you had a copy that you transcribed and gave to your kids. Um, and then you found, you found that old one and you see like, oh, there's some differences in the words in this older manuscript than what I gave to my kids. Which one's more accurate? The older one. So that's the prevailing thought. So the King James was based on some specific manuscripts that they had at the time. Through archaeological work, more was found. And so translations are continuing to be uh, redone based on that. So when we look at, so that's to say, when we look at the original, if we look at the original for the King James, it might be different than the Hebrew that the Revised Standard or the NIV is based on. So there gives, that gives us a challenge right there, which is, might be why vanity instead of evil. It might also be that the meaning of vanity has changed from the 1600s to today. Uh, in, you know, because uh, you know, there's other challenges when you not challenges, but you read through the King James, you'll find other words that don't have the same meaning that they have today. So in that sense, that could be a, the really the right translation. Uh, so th- those are some of the challenges when you start looking at the original text. And then there's always that how what did that word mean at that time? Uh, one of the resources I have, and I what, didn't bring these with me because they're multi-volume, uh, and I just didn't want to carry all that stuff in my car. Um, but I have a, 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 a collection of, you know, a, a, it's basically an encyclopedia of Hebrew words from the Bible, and I would look up that word evil, and it would say, here's how it's used in other um, biblical texts. Here's how it was used in non-biblical texts at the same time. Um, and here's what it meant when it was heard by people at that time. Uh, so and then you need to narrow that down because something that a word that occurs in um, in Isaiah will be different than a word that occurs in Song of Solomon because they're from different time periods. So now we have to start to ask ourselves what was that time period, and then really start to try to pull out the nuances, the context, all that stuff when trying to understand that word. This is what translators do. This isn't what I do this sometimes, but not all the time because I'm again theologian. I decided I went to move towards theology and not biblical studies because that's a lot of work. <laughs> and I wanted an easier out. No. Uh, but that, that would be the work that, you know, if you really want to look at that, that would be the kind of work that I would recommend doing. Well, one example I have is for many years ago, Ingrid and I were in Norway in our campsite, an old fashioned spot, and the other spot in the mirror that says, Don't look at yourself, it's vain. You know? mm. Humanity is evil. Yeah. Oh, and that, and that can be one other point, which is quite, yeah, so yeah, it, it, uh, Ray was saying that there were these mirrors that said, don't look at yourself, vanity, you know, it, it, vanity is evil. Yeah. And, and let's remember that when the King James Bible was being written, it was um, with these Calvinists um, who were pushing some ideas uh, and uh, Anglicans who were pushing ideas. And, they, and King James was saying, try to get along and come up with a translation that both groups can agree upon. Uh, and, and for many of you know, like from that Calvinist Puritan background, there was this high pietistic approach of saying stuff like don't look at yourself. Vanity would be evil. So in that sense, too. So we also want to look at the time period when the Bible was written, um, by, uh, that Bible was translated. Bibles are translated with an agenda. All, bi- all translators also have an agenda. 
Not a bad one, but everyone trying to make a point. So vanity in that sense. Boy, one word difference and you get a whole lecture on source critical theory and all that. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, verses 10 and 11, you use the word food and I got soul. If you offer your food to the hungry and what do you have? Soul. Soul, S-O-U-L? Yes. yes. The afflicted soul. Yes, afflicted soul. Huh. That's not even close. <laughs> that is. is it, so if you offer your soul to the hungry? Yeah. yeah. Satisfy the afflicted soul. And satisfy the need of the afflicted soul. Maybe that's a translator calling to give us an answer of why that difference. <laughs> Hopefully that's true. Food. And he has that, draw out thy soul to hunger and satisfy the afflicted soul. Hmm. Meaning, again, ministering to both the physical needs of the people, the hungry, as well as their spiritual needs of the people, the afflicted soul. That is interesting. Ah. So that... I, and that, that one, I would want to look, I'd have to do more research of where that difference between soul. I like how you, have, you offer your soul to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted soul. That's nice writing. I mean, you have you know, some nice parallelism. Um, but it's slightly different. I mean, food is the physical. Offer your food to the hungry, satisfy the needs of the afflicted, keeping with that, that physical. Um, I like the focusing on the spiritual as well. Um, there's some stuff going on that I think would call just for more research and, and such. Yes? The ESV has, if you pour yourself out for the hungry, and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. Pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted. That feels like a nice middle um, way between those two. The NIV is the same. The NIV is the same? Does anyone have a revised? I have the NRSV. Does anyone have an RSV? Yeah, it's, uh, that's, that's what it says there, too. In the RSV, it says that. Yeah, it says, um, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted. If you pour yourself for the hungry, satisfy the desires of the afflicted. I, my, one of my go-tos, if I'm really wondering, the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, tends to be more literal in its translation. Um, so if I have questions about the words, that's one of the sources I go to before going to the Hebrew itself, because my Hebrew is just not great. Um, so that makes me think that this pouring out yourself, and I wonder if there's a word here in the Hebrew that's just a hard one to translate. And so translators had to make a decision. And again, soul, we talked about this yesterday, no, Monday, it's Wednesday, today's Wednesday. Uh, Monday, when love the Lord your God with all your soul, soul is a, is a different kind of term that for us to think about, it would not have made sense at that time when we think of the soul as like separate from the body. Um, that's still a newer idea. Um, so the word soul, it might have been in there, but it might have meant this more sense with all of your life, with all of your essence. So pour yourself out feels like there's something there as well. Um, this is one of those great places. So if you uh, are good friends with a biblical scholar, so especially someone who focuses on the Hebrew scriptures, bring up this verse. And I'm sorry I don't have more to work with, with that, but boy, there's something going on in, that, in, the, in the Hebrew there that is more than we can capture in the English. Yes? Isn't it saying, um, what I'm getting is, what I'm getting is how that you do that. Because mm. Okay, I'm going to show up and feed the hungry. You need to have compassion and understanding. Yeah. And, um, and, and so it's how you do it. Pour I like that. Out. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, as opposed to just saying, here's some food, now go away. Um, really being present with them. And it's one thing just to, um, yeah, give food and walk away, but to give food and eat with them, that might be part of it, like starting a relationship. Yes? Because it could be hungry, not in the Mm -hmm. Maybe they're hungry for something else. Right. So it could give them. So good. Yeah. So just to repeat. So yeah, could be hungry for more <laughs> than food. And that's where we have that second part. Satisfy the needs of the afflicted. 
And if you use the soul translation, satisfy the needs of the afflicted soul, bringing us to the spiritual. I'm wondering if because of this discrepancy in translation, it's supposed to be a both and. Feed the people that are hungry and be with those who are hurting. That kind of thing. Boy, how great it is to hear different translations because we miss stuff when we just stick with one. Anything else? We're, anything else with this section or other things? But not, not to say we need to move on yet. But other mo- parts of this section that jump out translation-wise. Okay, we're going to go to the last section, and then we'll start to unpack this even more. This is thirteen and fourteen. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interest on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath of delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interest or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Yes, Donna? You have trample at the beginning? Yes, if you refrain from trampling the Sabbath. is turned back. If you say, say, read the whole part. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath. Oh, okay. If you turn back your foot from the Sabbath as opposed to if you refrain from trampling the Sabbath. I like that if you turn back your foot from the Sabbath has a more poetic feel. Um, more literal. And it probably is more literal. Tra- and, and, and you know the translators probably were like trample. And so, I think of trample as going forward. Yeah. yeah. But turn back. Well, you know what's great about that word, too? And that's one where I would like to look at the Hebrew. A word that occurs with the prophets a lot is shuv, which means turn. And they're constantly calling the people. If you look at early Isaiah, first Isaiah, Isaiah is saying, shuv, turn back. Turn back to God. Because the idea is you're walking in the wrong direction. Turn around and come back to God. And so if that's the sense to hear the word shuv with Isaiah, it should get the alarms going like, oh, this is important. And to say, turn back your foot from the Sabbath. Turn back from trampling the Sabbath, from um, you know, disrespecting the Sabbath, and turn back towards what is right. So that word, turn back, has significance um, with Isaiah and with other prophets as well. Other, Don? Uh, the New Revised Standard says, if because of the Sabbath you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy day. Wow. If because of the Sabbath you say the rest of it? You, you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure on my holy oh, day. Oh, okay. And I from pursuing your own interests on my holy day. I, so I think that it, it, that's very, very similar. It's just a different kind of wording. Linda? Um, I have the NIV, and here it says, if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath. Mm. And then a little commentary says that at the time, uh, people were not supposed to, on the Sabbath, go too far. Yeah, and today still. Just stay around. Yeah. Oh, that's that continues to be a, a practice. I mean, not I'm never. I can never speak for all Jews. I really can't speak for any. Um, but there are, you know, it's probably with the more Orthodox pract, um, Jews that you are not to go too far. Um, you can, you know, walk to to temp, to the synagogue as long as it's not too far of a walk, um, because you really want to avoid working. But I like that you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath. That has a different feel from trampling. I mean, you can trample flowers, and if they're healthy, they'll come back, right? Yeah. Yes? I was just going to say that in New York City, a lot of, uh, there are a lot of Jewish people who, are, who definitely, you know, you can't get in a car, you can't turn on your stove. You have a thing in elevators, it's called the Sabbath elevator, mm. where it stops on every single floor because they're not supposed to touch the um, elevator and make it go. You're not allowed right. to do that. That's what very hard stuff. Yes. So that yeah, so there's that those practices. Has anyone ever been a Shabbat goy, or know what that is? Um, the Shabbat goy would be a Gentile who you know, goes to a Jewish household, turns on and off the lights, um, opens the mail. <laughs> yeah, our neighbor across the street was the cantor at the Jewish synagogue, and uh, we became friends with him. And on Saturday uh, night, he would come over, and that 
asked me to turn on lights, shut off lights, turn on the stove, turn mm -hmm. off the stove. And he wouldn't use my doorbell. He would knock on the door because everything was fired. Right? Yeah. And so that's just this practice of, of observing the Sabbath. And we'll, we'll get to that because we'll talk about Sabbath observance as well. Um, but it's fascinating stuff. So that idea of like not walking too far, don't break the Sabbath, that has a lot of importance. Um, any other translation differences in those last two? Frank? So turn away the, your foot. It says opposed to turn back or trample. So that's even a stronger emphasis, it feels like, of really pulling back. And in the strength of the emphasis makes you wonder of like how bad was it yeah. <laughs> I mean if, if people were getting it pretty close and doing okay you would say look at try not to do that anymore but if it's really bad you're not gonna say try not to like you've got to stop you got to turn back completely you're missing it so the, the the strength of the emphasis speaks to how bad things were at the time other translation differences those last two verses Excellent. So we made it through the passage. <laughs> and I, I really do love hearing the different translations. It really brings out so much. So what's going on in this? There's a lot that's happening. Uh, you know, this is, it's almost, there's a poetic feel for this passage, um, and that you have these, these rhetorical questions being asked, um, and then you have this move, and here's what will happen, the, the 8 through 12 has this, here's how, here's this restoration will occur, and then 13 and 14 has the sense of, and here's how I want you to get there by your observance of the Sabbath. And, and it's, it's speaking against this idea of a self-righteousness that's based on how well you're worshiping, which is really interesting when it ends with this focusing on the Sabbath. But it's setting everything up in a different way before getting to the Sabbath. So the critiques beforehand that I read is saying, you are focused on the way you're worshiping so much and you think you're so great because of the way you're worshiping or because of the way you're fasting, but you're missing so much and you're getting it wrong. Let me tell you how I want you to do it. And now let's talk about the Sabbath. So this interesting thing, I want to point out, I mean, this is just kind of fun. In verse 9, um, it says, if you, uh, this is near the end of verse 9, if you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil. Do you have any sense of what the pointing of the finger is? We might think of this wagging like this. No, it's an offensive gesture. Oh, I'm not going to show you. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it changes from culture to culture. I mean, we, but I mean... I think it's, it, it's actually, I mean, it's fun to know that, but also think about how bad things were. Where's what you need to remove the yoke from among you? What yoke is that? These offensive gestures you're making towards each other? The speaking of evil? Is it getting that bad? Is the animosity in the culture that bad that people are cussing each other out? Flipping each other off? You know, doing those kind of things? This is the yoke to remove? Which is hard because if you go to someone who has that kind of approach and you say, you know, you really shouldn't do that, um, what's their first response? Well, they started it. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have said those words if they didn't cut me off or something like that. Yes, Carol. I've seen in other vernacular translations, and the wagging of the tongue. Oh, and the wagging of the tongue. Yes. The, the obscenities we share. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're separated. So the mm. animosity is yeah. a little bit like that separation when we're feeling separated and isolated. Oh, I like that a lot. So, the, in case, so how the yoke separates the oxen. And this animosity, I'm, I'm just repeating, so this animosity is creating the separation. And Isaiah is not speaking just to one person, but to the people. And so saying, here's the yoke that you have on you, this burden that's keeping you down. I love that. That's separating you as well. You've got to remove that. And isn't that interesting that we hear that? That's in verse 9. In verse 6, we have, What is the fast that I choose to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke? And we may hear that initially as, 
this literal kind of oppression of like saying you've got to stay in your class or you know you're not welcome at this table like you know these rules that separate people physically but then moving on further in the speaking of evil the wagging of the tongue the pointing of the finger this is part of the yoke and so now the you know the thing that the yoke that we need to undo is not just these physical limit uh, um, forms of oppression but also these ways in which we're living as a culture you know the yoke on our heart to remove that as well and how it separates us from each other uh, so it's not it, it, it moves it goes deeper uh, but I do think it's important that we start with the physical loose the bonds of injustice you know Bring the homeless poor into yourself. Share your bread with the hungry. These are physical, actual things you can do, but the prophet doesn't stop with that. Yeah. What is the status of slavery in the mm. at this time? What is the status of slavery at this time? Um, I'm not positive. I'm going to speculate. Slavery has you know, been a part of, all, of cultures all throughout. So it is possible that there were slaves. Um, um, if they were, the, the, it would have been through conquest, um, those kind of things. It's likely that for the people at this time, there weren't slaves, uh, or it's, yeah, because they were recently freed people. I um, mean, they're still trying to you know, get themselves back together. Um, so there's, you know, there's a likelihood that there weren't slaves at that time, but they were still a different in classes. You know, a, a wealthy class, there were only two, the wealthy class and then the unwealthy class. I'll get to you. Um, um, so uh, one other thought, one other point, and then Scott, we need to always remember that when we're thinking about slavery and reading about slavery in the Bible, um, because some still do this and say, you know, God is not against slavery because it's in the Bible, therefore, you know, what's happened in the United States wasn't that bad. What we did in the United States was chattel slavery and selling humans as livestock. That is egregious evil a sin. Uh, and I want to make sure that you hear me. And I, you weren't asking this. This isn't you. But, you know, once you open the door, I just want to say, um, you hear me that there is no way in which God justifies that. Uh, I, at least the God that I follow does not look at that and say, well, you just got it a little wrong. No, it's wrong. Just categorically evil okay the the so the moral equivalency that we get off track with is american slavery being one of uh, forced slavery and there it's, there has always been indentitude mm. throughout the yeah. history and so that uh indentitude was always present throughout all societies uh, it is, you reference it as classism or casteism, and that um, is taken to greater and lesser lengths depending on cultural swings during the, the, those periods. So it, it, at the very least, there would have been indentured mm. servants who may or not, you know, from our perspective, were being treated like slaves because oftentimes it was really the nastiest work assigned to them. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, that's a good, I like that clarification as well. So, I mean, there was certainly oppression of people, and that has occurred as well. Yes? I've been trying to simplify this in my mm. head as we're, as we're talking, and I went back to uh, verse 7, and it, it strikes me that the whole passage is really saying create community. Mm. So feed, house, and clothe, mm -hmm. basic, basic human needs are in verse 7. And then, not to hide yourself from your own kin, I'm reading as sort of create community. Mm. Open yourself up to others. And, and the rest of it, I think, follows. It's a directive to think of the larger whole than just yourselves. I love that. I love that reading of it. And, and, and if we, we take that and, and follow into you know, verses 11 and 12, it says, here's what will happen. If you do these things, here's what's going to happen. The Lord will guide you continually, satisfy your needs in parched places, and make your bones strong. And whenever we speak of parched places in that climate, it really has significance. Um, but not just parched we need water, but those parched places where there's alienation, uh, where there's a sense of uh, deprivation of uh, community, a sense of self. 
um, those, those parched places make your bones strong. You shall be like a water garden, like a spring of water, whose waters never failed. We have this, now, this idea of this beautiful garden um, that will occur there if you do these things. And remember, this is always written to a community. This is written to a gathering of people. Um, the individual is, a, is a still a somewhat modern concept. Um, so when we read this and read this as God is speaking to me specifically, um, sure, yes, God speaks to us through Scripture. He speaks to our hearts through Scripture. Um, but it, I think it should always then it should also be brought into the brought to the community as well. So one of the things happening here is this also this question of God's justice. And if we remember from yesterday, justice is this bringing this balance back together. And, and, and now where we have, with this Isaiah passage, this deepening of this understanding of justice. We're having uh, other dimensions added. A compassion in justice. Feeding the, the, you know, giving bread to the hungry. But not just giving bread, sharing your bread with the hungry. Bringing the homeless poor into your house. So don't, it's not building a house so that they have somewhere to live and you don't have to think about them anymore. It's saying, come live with me. I mean, it's not cooking an extra loaf and giving it to the hungry so that you don't have to worry about it. It's saying, come and have supper with us. When you see the naked, cover them. And, and this is great poetry. When you see the naked, cover them and, do not, and not to hide yourself. So cover the naked, but don't hide yourself. That's that's nice um, balance of, of poetry. And that's what we've been talking about. Let yourself really be seen for who you are. So bringing this sense of balance um, in the society, this compassion. Uh, and one of the words that, that I think it really makes sense here is Sabbath. Um, shalom, sorry. Uh, no, Sabbath. Because uh, uh, Sabbath, well, Sabbath and Shalom have these two um, connecting ideas. And we think of Sabbath as a day of rest, right? And we're going to get to that more in, in a second. But Sabbath is not quite a day of rest. It's a day of balance. Uh, I think I've recommended, oh, yeah, last, yesterday in the afternoon, I recommended a book for people to read, H. Richard Niebuhr's Christ and Culture. Read it, don't read it, it's fine. You won't hurt my feelings. <laughs> but another book, and this one I strongly recommend, is by Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, hopefully some of you have heard of him. Brilliant um, Jewish scholar, mystic, civil rights activist. Uh, and he wrote this short little book called Sabbath. And it's beautiful. Uh, and, and when I read it, I feel like I'm walking into this amazing synagogue. This place that is a devotion to worship. And in, in this book, Heschel writes about the purpose of Sabbath is to find balance again in your life. To bring this, this evenness back to your life. And, and that's why shalom is a part of that. In Sabbath, we want shalom. And we define shalom as peace. right? That's the, the common definition. But shalom is harmony. It's peace through harmony. Not peace through everyone just being still. But finding this balance. Um, finding this place where everything is back as it should be. You know, so... It's, you know, so when we talk about like Sabbath with creation care, you know, finding shalom with creation care, it's making this space where balance returns. Um, that we saw a bald eagle a couple of days ago says something's going on with the water. Someone told me there was a time when the river was really polluted, right? How do we, how do we solve that? We clean out the pollutants, but then we've got to wait. And let the ecosystem come, you know, find this place, not just of rest, but of balance again. That's the justice. That's the Sabbath that, that we're looking for. So let's take that idea of Sabbath and Shalom together and look again now at verses 13 and 14. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, this time when you can find balance in yourself and in your community, and refrain from pursuing your own interest on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and a holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways or serving your own interests or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord. If you focus on the Sabbath not a, and making it not about you, then you shall take delight. 
And you might say, so what are we supposed to make it about? Well, look up just a little bit ahead, you know, beforehand. A time when you feed, a time when you house, a time when you take care of the least. One of the things that challenges me with this is this means the Sabbath could be a day of work for some of us. And, and I love the Sabbath being a day of rest because uh, so many of us need that, right? But maybe it also needs to be a day of work of bringing that societal balance that's, being, that's missing. What if the Sabbath, on the Sabbath you said, so today I'm going to go and collect food for the hungry? Because that's part of Sabbath for me, because it's not about me. It's about all, and especially the least. And here, this is the thing that's really significant. We start, I started by saying a fast was a time of mourning, a time of, of penance, a time of contrition. And that's a very personal thing. So you start this, if, if you're fasting because you say, I know I've, I've done wrong by God, and so I need to make it about you know, showing how bad I feel. And, and then Isaiah is saying, that's not what it's about. The fast is about being aware of the least in our society. The people that are hungry, that are homeless, that are naked, taking care of them. And then saying, so now obey the Sabbath. Make the Sabbath holy. Make it a delight in the Lord. And you do that by going to those who have it the hardest first. Um, some scholars call this God's preferential option for the poor. And, and we'd like to think that God loves all God's children equally, and God does. Um, and ask any parent, you know, which child do you love the best? Um, and they'll say, oh, I love all my children equally. Um, but ask them after they just had a yelling match with one child, which children do you love the best? I love all my children equally, but this one a little more than that one right now. <laughs> Or, ask a parent right after a kid falls and, sk and really skins their knee and is crying, which child are you going to go to first? The one who's doing fine or the one who fell down and is crying? And because you go to the one that's crying doesn't mean you love the other one any less. But you go to where the need is most, right? Why not God? And, and God certainly can do it. If God is infinite, if God can be in all places at all times, if God, if God is beyond our knowing and is all-powerful, then God can be with us who are doing okay and with those who are hurting the most. But calls us to go to those who are hurting the most as well. Preferential option for those who are hurting. That preferential option for the poor. If you do that and take delight in the Lord, I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. So this end is, is what we're now finding with what's called, I think, an eschatological view of justice. Eschatological, eschatology is a fancy way of saying the end times. Eschaton is Greek for last things. So it's saying, here's where you will be headed. To this time when you will ride upon the heights of the earth, I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob. That's beautiful writing. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob. The promises I made to Jacob, the devotion that I found from Jacob, the people that we were when you were with Jacob, that will be given to you. You will be able to reclaim that very thing you're trying to reclaim, but just doing it wrong. And then, and we were talking about this more, or beforehand, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. That's a powerful um, phrase. Normally when we hear the prophets, they start with saying, here is the word of the Lord. Um, this is the voice of the Lord. We, we get that kind of image. But now we have, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Giving this emphasis to what, is being, what, what, what we had just heard. Saying, you've got to really go back and listen to this again. This is serious. And Isaiah would say, it's all serious, but listen to it all. But here, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So I think it, it leads us to this place of wondering about Sabbath and Sabbath practices for us. We were talking beforehand how there was a time when, as a society, we treated Sabbath, which um, for the most, um, because you're regular Adventist and not Seventh-day Adventist primarily, we can say a Sunday, right? Um, and there might be some of you who say, no, no, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I just kind of get along with everyone here not to cause trouble. So then make it Saturday. Um, for those who are um, you know, aligned more with the Ju Judaic tradition, it will be Friday night to Saturday night. Um, but let's just say Sabbath being Sabbath. Pick the day. Um, but a time when society said, you know, shops will be closed. Um, we'll take our time to be by ourselves. I, I, I know a man, um, when he was growing up, 
his father said, you may not listen to, and you may not read the funny papers, um, because you don't do that on Sundays, you don't do that on the Sabbath. And he said, his father, it wasn't until um, the Red Sox actually made, was doing well that he wouldn't even listen to sports. But then when the Red Sox started doing well, he started listening. I know. How far does our devotion go? And, and there's something good about putting aside a day, right? Now, there's something really good about that, about saying this is a day that's going to be different than the rest of the week. Um, a day I'm going to put aside to, to go to church, um, to pray, to be with family, and to rest. Now, um, we have a practice, the practice has generally been um, for most of us to rest, some of us have to work a little harder. And I'm not really talking about pastors. I mean, sure, but we'll take Monday off instead. <laughs> but those who say well, to rest, which means we're going to have a big family dinner, means that there are people who are going to be working hard that day to make sure everyone else gets a big family dinner. And it tended to be women because we still live in a patriarchal society. That could be a conversation for another time. Men, step it up. <laughs> yeah. Don't be just a grill master. Make them dinner. No. But, I mean, it's still nice it's like to have that time. But is that the way we should be thinking about Sabbath based on what we had just read? Does what, is this passage from Isaiah challenge our own understanding of appropriate Sabbath practices? What are some of your thoughts? This is, this is a time for we can, I can, we can have a little bit of conversation here. Some thoughts about that. Yes, time. Um, in my church, on the first Monday of every, uh, first Sunday of every month, um, in my church on the first Sunday of every month, we sent a group of people, whomever is willing, down to the soup kitchen in Hartford, mm. and they helped to serve meals. And other churches take the other Sundays, so that. That, and they do, always do it on Sundays. Is it during the work, uh, during Sunday morning, during the worship time? It's, it's Sunday noon. Sunday noon. So as soon as people get out of church, there's people who will not stay for Bible study or do anything else on that day. We also have a gentleman who's retired who, um, even on Sundays, but other days too, goes around to grocery stores and gets bread mm. and muffins and things like that and takes them down to the soup kitchen. That's fantastic. Other, other thoughts about this? That's so doing things on the sun. Steve, uh, John and Steve right behind you. At the risk of uh, maybe taking this a little farther than you intend. Oh, go ahead. Um, I find, find this very interesting in the conversations about what's um, acceptable observance of Sabbath is, um, can be, be viewed uh, not only um, on its own, but you can expand that, in my mind, you can expand that uh, to um, our view of a lot of these Old Testament scriptures. Hmm. It's just that how, how modern day Christians view pronouncements made a long time ago in a, in a culture so different than what we have, in an environment so different than what we experience. Um, I think it's it's always a challenge. The this, this Sabbath is just a great um, this Sabbath discussion is just a great um, uh, way of of, um, of questioning how we do all of this stuff. Mm. Because um, we we listen to uh, Robin and the um, I forget what the term was the Sabbath the elevator. Oh yeah, which to us seems. Wow, it's mindless allegiance to, to something that has no real relevance to us. And would uh, a loving God want us to observe that instead of what Connie's talking about, uh, going out and, and, and feeding the hungry? So then it, yeah. it just draws into question all sorts of, you know, you can just leaf through. Um, the Old Testament and say, are we um, being, serving an allegiance to some really outdated um, practices mm. and principles as opposed to living 
um, a Christian mm. uh, perspective to our community and, and really sort of, uh, of um, living to the spirit of some of what we're reading today, but not necessarily literal. That is a great, a great question. And, um, I think it. I, I think you're right that we always have to remember that this was written a long time ago to people in a different context. And not just this Isaiah, but New Testament as well. And at the same time, humanity hasn't changed that much. I mean, our technology has changed, our understanding. I mean, we have changed a lot in many ways, um, but our selfishness still continues. Our piety that gets in the way of our devotions still continues. Uh, and, and so, uh, and, and we could, I could probably list out, you know, people are still being oppressed. We're still a lot of looking the other way at the hungry. We're still, so part of the reason why I think context is so important, and not just the context of the text, but also the societal context, uh, what, what scholars would call like a social historical reading, is to learn what was going on then, what were they speaking to, and then our job is to say, where are the similarities with what's going on today? And I know there are um, churches out there that put everything they have into making sure worship is as brilliant as possible. Uh, and, and because it comes out of this sense of like, we want to lift up people. We want worship to be a place where you can have, like it says, take delight in the Lord, uh, where you can just praise God. And, and there's moments when that's really appropriate, right? When we need to have those moments, those, that time when we're in our own place of like, I, I just need to be in a place where I can connect with God, I can experience God, I can feel God. But if that's all we do, and then if that's the thing we start to brag about, um, if that's the practice we start to lean on, then we're falling into that place that Isaiah is criticizing. Um, or if we start fasting and showing off about it. Um, I, love, I love the conversations that lead up to Lent. When people, those who follow the practice of giving up something for Lent, say, what are you going to give up? And someone says, I'm giving up social media. Ha, ha, ha. You know, like, just why don't you just wear the sackcloth, paint your face with ash, so you can show off how great you are and what you're giving up. That's not the point. And that's what Isaiah is criticizing as well. Uh, so I think... To, to be aware of the differences, but then to say, where are we? Or another way of looking at it, this is, it's a, this is what's known as like a narrative reading. Where are we in the story? Uh, and that's, as I mentioned before, we would like to think that we're there with Isaiah saying, shame, shame, shame. But more, um, if more probably, we're the people Isaiah is talking to. Um, think about what's happening with a lot of our churches today. Um, in the United States, a lot of churches are struggling. Um, attendance is dwindling. Um, they're trying to keep their buildings together. And, and we may look at this and say, are we moving into a time of exile? Were we at a place where we were doing really well in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, that people were going to church and we said, hey, everything's good, we don't have to worry. And there were those prophetic voices that say, um, you're missing a lot. Uh, and if you keep missing it, you're going to falter and fall. Are we moving into exile? Are we in a place now trying to return from exile and rebuild? I wouldn't say so. But where are we in this story? Uh, yes, yes. Stepping back a little, as we, sit, as we sit around the preacher stand here, the tent as we used to call it, uh, growing up here, um, we couldn't uh, get out of our church clothes on Sunday. Hmm. We couldn't swim on Sunday. Uh, we used to sneak off, but we weren't supposed to <laughs> swim on Sunday. It was sitting around, and I'd say to my mother, uh, what are we supposed to do? And she said, well, sit and read your Bible. Who was a kid wanted to sit around yeah, right? and sat in church all day? <laughs> I can't read your Bible, you know? So uh, it was so legalistic here. And uh, so Bernie and I uh, got into a ministry of going to a drug and alcohol rehab center on Sunday mm. evenings and served there for many, many years. And that was blessed us, I think, a lot more than it blessed the other people. Mm. But I have written in my Bible here, and I don't know what I, like, what I should do is 
write dates when I write these things, but I put uh, empty ourselves of pleasure and things and be filled with what God can give us. Mm. And I think uh, that to me is what Sunday is all about. Be filled with what God can give us. I, I, I love that. And, and that idea, I mean, this is one of the things that Jesus was talking about with this overemphasis on a legal, a legal, a legalistic view of Sabbath. Where he said, you're, you, you know, you tell your children to turn, turn your parents in and you're missing all that, that part of the Ten Commandments of honoring your father and mother. Uh, John, you wanted to... Yeah, yeah I, I, I often find myself drawn to the simple, even simplistic uh, interpretation of things. I think it's saying something as simple as give one day a week. And even Heschel says it, your day might be Thursday, your day might be Sunday, whatever. But give one day a week to the Lord and His people. Mm. That's and, and how that's done. And so where so it is so important. I, I think um, just so couple of thoughts. Um, for those, you know, it, uh, that do follow this kind of legalistic approach, uh, I want to, you know, I want to give, just to speak to, especially the Jewish community that follows that, um, those who, uh, there's going to be always a diversity of, of approaches. But one of the reasons why many of them have such a strict view is partially this understanding of how you approach Torah, that you put fences around Torah so that you don't get close to breaking the really important commandments, the ten ones the Ten and then the Shema. So you have these other rules to help keep you safe. But also, even the practices of going in a different elevator on, on the Sabbath reminds you of what's going on that day. Of having to ask someone else to turn on and off your lights reminds you of what's going on that day. Um, for a while, I would fast, during Lent, I would fast on Fridays. Um, I might do that again this year. I don't know. I don't plan it. I'll, I'll decide right beforehand. Uh, and I, I didn't tell people, I didn't even tell my wife, and I would come home, and she would say, yeah, you know, supper's going to be ready. I said, okay, um, I'll eat in an hour, because I would fast from sunrise to sunset. And she said, why are you not eating? I'm like, oh, I forgot to tell you. <laughs> I'm fasting. Sorry. Um, the reason I did it was as a reminder of who Christ is. So that every time, at the meal times, I would take the time to pray on the cross, um, because we were, that's where we were headed with Lent. And every time I felt hungry, I would think about the suffering of the world. Uh, but that's an important, that was a devotional choice of my own. I think we start to get into trouble when we impose that on others. When we say, now everyone has to do it this way. And it starts to get restrictive, right? Saying you have to wear your church clothes all day, just sit down and read your Bible. That's a great way to get kids running from the church. <laughs> um, not that church is supposed to be fun anyways. I mean, I mean a little bit, but not a lot. This is serious. Yeah, serious. I think we, that idea of balance is so important. Uh, I'll get to you in a second, Bill. Um, that idea of trying to bring balance back in your life and balance back in the world. Yeah. So one of the other things that's going on, it, it, Haggai and Zechariah are places to find out that, mm. but the temple is being rebuilt. And yeah. This was, this was a big time emphasis for lots of people. And they would have their servants working on the Sabbath who weren't Jewish to... And, and uh, so that the temple could get rebuilt, so that things could happen, and also that their streets could get rebuilt, and all those kinds of things. And that's why one of the things that's talked about in here is, uh, in mm. a little bit earlier, is you have, you have to treat your servants well. Oh, I, I love that. Thank you for that. Would you do have more? Well, I was, I was just thinking to myself, there's, there's so many ways that sometimes we can have adventures of missing the point when we're doing our stuff as well, but... It somehow, mm -hmm. as was talked about before, that somehow it's impacting somebody else. And uh, so anyway, it's a, it's a whole lifting up community mm -hmm. that came before I was thinking about that. And you know what's really cool about that is there's a universality in that call. That Isaiah, so thank you for that, that and Isaiah is saying, like, you're, you know, you're mistreating your servants who might not have been Jewish. Um, Isaiah is saying, it doesn't matter if they're Jewish or not. They're still God's children. Don't mistreat them. That it's not just about the chosen people now, it's about all God's people, all God's children. Um, so there's, there's now there's this universality, and that's found in other parts in the prophets too. Where, you know, I will build up a, you know, the Zion shall be lifted up on a mountain and all nations shall come. Um, that there isn't this particularity that this is just about us and just about our people, but it's about all of God's people and that we need to be aware of that. I, I love that. David? I find the discussion of Sabbath very interesting 
um, but not satisfying. Hmm. Because I jump through, what about the other six days of the week? What are we doing? Hmm. And it seems a little bit, it's important for Sunday, for Saturday, whatever it is. The other six days have to be in there. And focusing, like anything, you talk about balance. Yeah. Let's also figure out what's going on in the other six days. Bill. When we say give a day a week, a day is 24 hours. If we're awake for 14 or 16 hours a day, and we give two hours a day or two and a half hours a day, like David was saying, most people need to eat every day. So if we're doing something for with God in mind every day, and we spent just like we're supposed to tie, you know, ten percent of our income. If we give X percent of our time, is that a good thing to do too? Instead of taking a day off for us. I think yeah. I think giving your time on a regular basis is always valuable. I think still looking at that Sunday is, and I'd like us to move away from thinking of Sunday as a day of rest as a Sunday a day of renewal. Um, Sunday is a day of reconnecting, of, of reclaiming in some parts. Because uh, think of, of if someone is doing, if someone is a social worker and, and working with the least every day. And those of you who know social workers or are social workers, you know it's a thankless job, it's tireless, like it's horrible. Then you want to say, okay, it's Sunday, now go to the soup kitchen and serve. Well, I've been serving all week. In, as, in, in my job. I need a day. So in that sense, it might be right to say, take this day, you know, go to church, and then do what you need to do to replenish yourself so that you can go back and serve. If someone's doing something else where they're not serving all week, then you might say, there's a part of you that's, that's hurting. So take this day and go and serve so you can replenish yourself so that you can get through this week. And ideally you would be doing a little bit every day, right? Um, and, and hopefully it would be a mix of, uh, a little, of devotion every day. That would, I, would, I would recommend that. Um, however that might be, Bible reading, prayer, some kind of devotion every day, some kind of service every day, and that will vary. Um, you know, it's, some, you know it's, it's something for yourself to replenish every day if you can. But the, that, the reality of our lives is, the rhythm of our lives is we still need that day. And God, in God's wisdom, has called us to take that day um, and to, to approach that day as a place to replenish and, 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 and bring back that, that balance. And I think, though, you know, not, it, this is challenging because then we can start to move into this kind of self-care place, which is really important. I, never, I don't want to be putting, saying self-care is not important. It is so important. But we don't want to neglect the social aspect that Isaiah is pulling us to as well. And if society is so unbalanced, then part of our self-care has to be care of others. Has to be care of others. <clears throat> um, this is something I wrestle with with my own work. I take people to the mountains. I take them to the wilderness. And I do because I, I believe strongly that it gives them a different sense of life. It, it feeds them. Um, but it, I have to make sure I emphasize this is not just about you, but now you need to go and look at the people who are hurting even more and how are you going to help them? If I make it just about us and our time, then it becomes a selfish kind of idolatry, which Sabbath can be. And we can create these laws and rules that, that build this pedestal that the idolatry of my Sabbath for me is stands upon. We've got to be thinking about others and about community. We're about at time. So here's the thought that I'm, I'm going to leave you with. Uh, I mean, there's a lot. We could think about, th this is a passage that's often read on Ash Wednesday, which is very interesting. Um, for those of you from the more liturgical tradition, um, how do we wrestle with that? Uh, but here's the, this is what I wrote out. There, there's a, a role and a place for the mystical or the spiritual in the, in the, in the liturgy. But we need service as well. How can our fast or more broadly, our emphasis on the spiritual be a place um, and a source of justice and action? Or more simply put, how can our worship be a place of action? 
So that's one of the thoughts. So the, again, we'll be meeting at 1 o'clock right here. That's one thought that we could talk about. Um, it's been fantastic. Yesterday we've got a, uh, a little primer into uh, atonement theory and the cross um, at the very beginning, and that was a lot of fun. So whatever kind of questions or wonderings that you might have had from this conversation, um, or by now from anything else, that's the, the 1 o'clock is for, but this sense of how can worship be a source of action is one other thing that we could talk about. Uh, let's close with prayer. God, oh, keep our eyes open to the suffering in the world. Suffering in creation, suffering in people, suffering as it occurs. Stir our hearts, Lord, so that we cannot find rest until we help those who are the most restless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.